All right, church, thank you for checking in. Today we're going to look in Mark chapter 16. We're, we're going to finish out our series in the book of Mark today. And we're going to look at this last section. Now, if you watched a couple of the previous videos, I talked a lot about Mark 16. And there's a big section of Mark 16. The majority of this chapter is not original to the Bible. And I showed you this note. You can go back and watch them. In fact, if, if this video strikes your curiosity and you did not see the previous couple uh, that I did, you should watch them all. They really kind of belong together to get the best of it. But in Mark 16, right here between um, verse 8 and 9, you will see a little note in most of your Bibles. It will say some of the earliest manuscripts do not include chapter 16, 9 through 20. Uh, now, if you have a King James Bible, chances are it will not say that. This is one of the, the core differences between the King James and most other translations uh, is, is their original source documents. Most people just think of the translations as different ways of speaking, different ways of writing, uh, Old English versus Modern English or whatever. But King James is actually based on different source documents. And earlier documents have been discovered since King James. And generally speaking, if you're talking about historical books, whether they're Bible books or anything else, earlier is considered to be more accurate than later. If, it's, if you have an event that happened in 33 AD, the resurrection, and you have a copy of a book about the resurrection from, say, 60 A.D., and you have another one from 300 A.D., well, use the one that was closer. That was written by somebody who was on the spot or, or was at minimum, at maximum, was one generation removed. Uh, if you have one that's a couple hundred years later, that's where uh, discrepancies can fit in. And, and that's one of the reasons why the Bible, why we know the Bible is so accurate, because our earliest documents date all the way back to when it happened. Uh, and so King James is based on documents, different documents. Now, they're 99% the same, but you will encounter little differences, and uh, Mark 16 is one of them. Um, and you will see a little note in, in most of your other translations saying um, that this verses 9 through the end aren't in the original. And so when we talk about the Bible being accurate and being inerrant and inspired by God, and it's God's word and everything. And then you encounter this random little bit here in Mark, and there are other places. Uh, this is one of the more prominent ones because it's in one of the Gospels, and it's the last half of the last chapter. Um, it might make you wonder, oh, how do we know the Bible's accurate then? If this part's you know, unreliable, then maybe the rest of it is. How do we know? Uh, and so we'll... We'll hit on that a little bit, but I already said the basics. If if it came in the, if the the earlier it is, generally speaking, the more accurate it is. Um, that that's a historical rule for any kind of historic documents. Um, and so we know the first sixteen and a half chapters of Mark are all a continuous whole that we have found documents that go all the way back for it. The last bit was added later, and that's why the note is there. Okay, so you might have read this, you might have memorized parts of, of the end of chapter 16, you might have heard teachings on it, is it like false teaching, is it full of errors and mistakes and stuff? I, I wouldn't say so, um, but when we say the Bible is inerrant and it's inspired by God, we mean the original. We mean the original text as written by the original authors in the original language. Everything else is a translation uh, from that. And so, is the English Bible inerrant, inspired by God? Well, in one sense, I would say absolutely it is, but in the other sense, no, it's not. Mark didn't write this. Mark didn't write in English. English didn't even exist yet. Uh, if King James English doesn't really exist now, languages change and shift. So that's why it's so important to study these things and go in depth with them and everything else. And it, that's why it's important when you are looking at, at historic documents and stuff that we, uh, that we pay close attention and we say, hey, this, this part of it actually isn't there. So you would ask, well, why is this even in there at all if we don't think it's part of the Gospel of Mark? And the reason for that is King James. Uh, blame, blame the King James translation. I don't mean blame it in a, uh, like, you know, come, come out against it as though it's, it's 
evil or bad or a false teaching translation or something. I just mean when when the King James was translated to English, they were using the best information they had, and that's what they had available, and they translated it to English. And then all these newer modern English translations started coming along that were based on different source documents, earlier source documents. And they said, well, if we cut out half of the book, of, half of Mark, the resurrection part of chapter 16, all the King James people are going to say, you're cutting the Bible up and we'll never sell a copy of the Bible and they'll accuse us of editing out the Bible. And so all your, your modern translations include it and they include it with a note because they don't want to be accused of cutting it out altogether because so many people, there's this heritage, generation over generation, of these verses. And, and some of them are relatively well known. There's... Um, there, there's a verse 17 that, or sorry, 18, that for whatever reason is, is well known. It says they will pick up serpents with their hands, uh, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them, and they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And that picking up serpents, poisonous snakes, you've heard of snake handling churches. They base it on this. They base it on this, this verse. And it's not, Mark didn't write it, guys. Uh, it, that, it, it doesn't appear that he did. The earliest copies of Mark don't have it. Don't have it at all. Um, and so, the, the, other than that little verse, though, I wouldn't say that there's any errors in it. And uh, ev even that, we know that it's, it's not fundamentally an error because we know from the book of Acts that Paul did pick up a poison snake, get bitten, and, and he was fine. So, um, it's, not, it's not a falsehood at all. But people do reach weird conclusions sometimes out of that stuff. Um, the original Gospel of Mark, as written by Mark, was inspired by the Holy Spirit. That is traditional Christian belief about all of Scripture. Um, not just for Mark, but all of Scripture. That, that's traditional. That, that crosses nearly all the denominational boundaries uh, for, for understanding Scripture. That the originals, as written by the original authors, were inspired. Everything else is translations. And when, when somebody finds an earlier copy and, there, and it's validated that this really is earlier and we can see that later ones were copied from the earlier one, earlier is better. The original is better than the photocopy, right? Find the original and that's what you base it on. But when, when the King James being published for hundreds of years was the dominant, pretty much the only English Bible for so many generations, people became familiar with it they became accustomed to it. So when new translations came out, they, they didn't want to be accused of cutting out part of Mark. They would be accused of editing the Bible. And people would, oh, I don't want to get that new. Can you believe the new translation? What are they, what's these guys' problem? They're, they're, you know, they're editing it out. So they leave it in and they put a note. And that's why the note's there. And it's important. Um, now, I understand many of you do not read your Bibles using, using a Bible. You, you read your Bible on some app, on your phone or something. I, I, I don't do that. I, I, I will look up Bible verses constantly on my phone, on my computer, on whatever. Um, it, sometimes it's convenient. But um, depending on, on how you're reading it in your app, it oftentimes won't have that note there. And you'll, you'll bypass it. You won't see it. Um, the actual hard copies typically have that in your apps. You can select, do you want verse numbers? Do you want footnotes? Do you want uh, author, do you want editor's notes? Do you want this stuff? And a lot of people just say, no, I, don't, I just want plain text. And when you do that, you don't realize it. But these, these places like Mark 16 can, can be overlooked, and you just keep reading along as though this is the original scripture. Um, and I, 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 I have a lot to say about Bible translations. Maybe I'll do a whole video on it sometime. But... Um, I think it is really important for you to have a real Bible, an actual Bible. The batteries have never run out on this thing. I've never had to recharge it, right? I have never been reading it, and it all of a sudden beeped at me and flashed up and changed the subject in front of my face, where a new message had popped up while I was reading this Bible. Never, ever happened. Now, many times while I'm reading a, a, a hard copy Bible, ideas pop into my head, that are coming from the Holy Spirit because I'm reading his word and it's his sword and he's, he's showing me things all the time. Um, my phone, though, 
man, phones are, are useful. I, I don't, I, I, I'm glad you have a Bible app on your phone. There's a lot of other apps you could have that are, that are sinful or they're just worse. Absolutely. But um, get a real Bible, get familiar with it. Get yourself accustomed to it. This Bible, if you want to read Mark 16 and read the rest of it, it's there. If, you're, if you become convinced through your research that that really is part of the book of Mark, the original, then it's right in there. If you become convinced that you see that note, you're like, hey, this isn't really it. I'll read it. I'll pay attention to see what it says, but not going to be a big deal for me. I'm, I'm going to study. I'm going to spend my time studying the rest of it. You can do that. You can choose to do that. Um, but think about, think about what this means if you're, if you're using an electronic Bible um, <clears throat> from some app. We know beyond any doubt, this, this YouTube channel, if you're watching this, this video on YouTube right now, you, you can go to our church's channel where you're watching this video, you're watching on our church channel, and th there, were, there are missing videos there that you will not see, that you cannot see, because YouTube one day pushed some button somewhere, an algorithm did it, no, it probably wasn't even a real person, uh, and it ceased to exist, it blinked out of existence in a moment. Um, uh, several of our videos, all right? Now tell me they couldn't do that with your Bible. Would you notice, for example, let me ask you this question. Would you notice if, um, say, a chapter of, I don't know, I'll just pick one, a chapter of the book of Hebrews suddenly stopped existing? Would you notice that? What about a chapter of, let's say, Isaiah chapter, I don't know, 17? Isaiah chapter 46? Would you notice if, if say, Psalm 12 just wasn't any, didn't exist anymore. Would you even notice? As long as they just changed the numbers, it didn't go from 11 to 13, it just went 11, 12, 13, whatever. But, but the actual psalm was, was missing and they just re, reordered the numbers. Would you notice? Would you notice if, if a Bible verse disappeared? Would you notice if a couple words in a couple Bible verses changed? Would you notice? You can't do that with a hard copy. It cannot be done. Somebody would have to come to my house or my church or my truck where my Bible happens to be seated or my hand and take it away and sneak back with a new one and put it back in its place. It, it wouldn't happen. That, like that, 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 I, I would know they did it if that happened. Your phone app, they can change that in a moment. And unless you have the Bible memorized word for word really, really well, you just would not notice at all. Amazon has done this with their Kindle app. Um, there is a book, and I'm not recommending this book, I've never read it, and my understanding of it is that it's uh, controversial at best, but it is a French book. Um, it is called The Camp of the Saints in, in, in English, and uh, people bought this book on Amazon Kindle about 10 years ago, or they, about 10 years ago it disappeared from Kindle. They took it away. People who had paid for it, people who didn't pay for it, or I guess everybody who had it had paid for it. But it ceased to exist. It just blinked out of existence because Amazon concluded that it was racist. And I'm not saying maybe, maybe it is racist. I, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> ceased to exist. Guys, listen. There's stuff in the Bible that gets accused of racism, that gets accused of intolerance and bigotry all the time. Homophobia all the time. There's, there's, a, there's a Bible company in... China called Amity Publishing House that the Chinese government owns that prints Bibles. It's printed more Bible. It, it's, it's the biggest Bible producer in the world. The Chinese government makes it, and it's different. Now, I don't read Chinese, Mandarin, any of those. <laughs> I don't know. But the people who do, the people who know English and can read their Chinese Bibles, or the people that know their Greek and Hebrew and can read their Chinese Bibles, say that the Chinese government changes it. And it's a bad translation. And I take their word for it. Why would I trust the Chinese government? I mean, I think oh, this is an obvious one, right? Of course I don't trust them to print a Bible. Well, do, you, do, you, do you trust your, your, uh, your Android device that Google owns? Your Apple device that Apple owns? Do you, do you trust those companies that, that they're going to leave your Bible alone? I hope, I hope they're trustworthy. I, 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 so I haven't heard any, any credible accusations that they are editing the Bible as of now. But would you be surprised if they did? And would you notice if they did? I confess I wouldn't. 
I mean, unless they did an obvious one, take John 3.16 and skip and just X that one out or something, you, people, people would notice that stuff. Um, would, would, would you notice if a couple words were changed, a couple words were deleted, a couple new words were added in? Would you notice, like, I don't know, the whole book of Obadiah disappeared? Would anybody notice? They took away Obadiah, just added some random stuff, changed it completely, wrote their own little thing. Would you notice? I don't know. So I know I'm going off on a tangent here. Uh, read your Bibles. Read the whole thing. Read the, read the rest of, of Mark 16. If um, <clears throat> I, I think it's worth reading. It's worth knowing what it says. But uh, I, I'm not going to teach through it like it's Scripture because I don't, I don't believe it is Scripture. I don't believe it, um, it was written by Mark. I don't believe it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. I don't think it's, it contains any dangerous falsehoods that will lead you out of salvation or anything. I don't believe that. But uh, I also don't believe Mark wrote it. Um, and and if, you, if you do read it, read the whole book of Mark, paying attention to Mark's uh, personality and the way he writes. And you will notice a clear shift in the way it's written, uh, just in verse 9. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. It's a clear summary. Um, <clears throat> it's a summarization of what happened next and how it worked, added in by somebody else. I don't know who. I assume they meant well. I don't think they were trying to do anything bad. But um, Matthew, Luke, John, all of them tell about the resurrection. If you splice together their explanations of the resurrection combined with Acts and some of the other stuff in the epistles, you could, you could replicate the rest of Mark 16 and say, yeah, that's all, that's all accurate. The only thing that I don't know of anywhere in the Bible is, is verse 18 there where it says, um, if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. I'm not aware, no, nothing comes to mind of that actually occurring in the New Testament. That doesn't mean it's false. It doesn't mean it's you know, a false gospel or something. It's just to say that every, everything in after these things, verse 12, afterward, verse 14, the language is different. His transitions from sentence to sentence, from paragraph to paragraph, are just different. It, it wasn't. It's not Mark's voice speaking when you read the, the, the last bit of Mark 16. Um, <clears throat> so that, that that's my admonition to you: study Scripture, learn it, know it well, get a real Bible, one that that takes up physical space. Uh, get accustomed to it. Get used to it. Find your way through the Scriptures. Um, study it. Read the footnotes. Pay attention to it. Um, the Bible's reliable, and and the scholars that that, that do the work on this, um, <clears throat> individually, you can't trust any individual person. But collectively, when you have a bunch of people dedicated to the scriptures, doing their very best to translate it, read read a few of them. The NASB New American Standard Bible is my favorite. In particular, I really love the 1995 edition. They made a new one, I think, in. 2017 or something like that. Um, it, it, I, I have, I've, I've read that one as well. I, I like it. For some reason, the 1995 language, um, maybe that's just my generation or something, uh, is, is my favorite Bible, and I trust it above all other translations for getting word-for-word -word accuracy. But like I said in one of the other ones, this is an ESV Bible. I've been reading this one uh, straight through steadily, I think at least two and a half years now. Um, and it's a very good one, and I recommend reading multiple translations, studying them, studying them well, because you're not going to get a perfect understanding in English just from one translation. But if you had to pick one, I would go NASB, and I would go 1995 with it, um, and read all the footnotes. All right, God bless you. Praise the Lord. I hope that is uh, something for you to think about, something to be aware of here with regard to Mark and translations and hard copies of the Bible in general. I'll talk to you tomorrow. We're going to get into an Advent series, and we'll do some topical stuff here through December. God bless.